1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of the second Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes and perverted judgment. And then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations." But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of, the, out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me, and serve other gods, so do they also." Unto thee. In kind of an overview, time has passed since that victory against the Philistines. And the, and the time has passed since Israel had been restored. Samuel is now old. It's kind of like a, 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 maybe a time that wasn't recorded. It's a lost time. We don't know exactly everything that happened during that time. But we know that Samuel now is towards the end of his reign as judge in Israel. He made his sons Joel and Abiah judges in the land. Samuel's uh, sons were not following after God now. They were more concerned with things. So they looked, they looked for Luke. They were more in, uh, uh, interested in things. They took bribes. They were interested in lucre. They perverted judgment. Maybe they uh, would, were, were judging over a, a certain scenario, and someone would come and say, hey, if you, if you rule this way, we'll give you something. You know, we'll, we'll give you some money. We'll give you some more sheep. And they did that. They perverted judgments, wickedness. The people of Israel had become discontent. They had seen this happen before. Think about, this is almost a carbon copy of what happened with Eli and his sons. Remember, Eli was an old man, 98 years old when he died. And uh, his sons were ruling there in the temple as well. And they were being wicked there in the temple. And Israel said, we've heard this before. We've seen this story. And they became discontent. It, and the reason that Samuel got frustrated when, it, when Israel came and they said, make us a king, it wasn't necessarily that Samuel was, um, felt like Israel was rejecting him, but he was frustrated because that was not the plan that God had for Israel. That wasn't the blueprint that God had laid out. God had laid out that they would have a judge, that they would have a preacher, not a king. So Samuel was frustrated that, again, Israel is going away from God. Samuel had lived long enough, he had seen Israel be away from God, come back to God, be away from God, come back to God. And he's got to be pulling out his gray hair thinking, what are you guys doing? You're going to do the same thing that you've done over and over again. I want to look at a couple principles from the passage before we get actually into the message, two of them. First of all, don't allow past failures to dictate future decisions. Don't allow past failures to dictate future decisions. Now, what I'm not saying is don't learn from past experiences. God often <clears throat> will put a failure, or God will help us learn from failures. When you do something uh, wrong or, or you, you mess up, you think, well, that was a, you know, that was a big mistake, and then don't do that again. I'm not saying don't learn from past experiences. When I was younger, I went out to the goat pen. I was supposed to feed the goats. And uh, during the winter, we had a couple of bales of hay that we would feed them. In the summer, we'd let them free range, but in the, in the summer, we'd, we'd have to, we had it you know, laid out very specifically. One square of hay, one scoop of grain is what they got every day. So it was my turn to go out and feed them, so I went out and fed them. Well, I didn't know it, but there was a, a garden rake that was kind of hidden under some of the hay and it had gotten covered up. So I went over to pick up some, uh, uh, you know, a square of hay and some grain, and I stepped on that garden rake, and it came and it hit me right between the eyes. And that was the time, you know, that nerd time in third grade where I had glasses. And uh, I'm still bitter at that third grade picture because <laughs> mom told me they look cool. And uh, they did not look cool. And uh, it was the last time I ever took any fashion advice from her. She's like, well, you know, you go to the, the place and you get to pick out whatever glasses you want. <clears throat> and I saw some that I thought were cool. And she's like, no, you should get these ones. Looking back now, they were probably the free ones, you know. <clears throat> So, I have my glasses on, that rake handle comes up and it hits me square in the eyes and it jammed those, you know, those little, uh, whatever those are called, those nose holder jiggers right into my face and it hurt. 
I stepped back and I was like, oh, kind of in a daze. I got super angry and I stomped on the rake. <laughs> and it came back and hit me right between the eyes again. I did not learn from my past failure. I went and did the same thing right again. Then I got really angry, but I threw the rake before I threw my temper tantrum, so that way I didn't step on it and have it come up at me again. But get this, in, in verse 3 and 4, Israel had gotten tired, frankly, of God's plan. They had gotten tired of God's man ruling, his sons coming in and perverting judgments and not following after God, but... Here's why I say don't allow past failures to dictate future decisions. This was not God's plan failing man. This was man failing God's plan. God had it lined up how he wanted his nation to be run. He had it lined up who he wanted to be rule, uh, to rule over the nation. And when the sons of Eli or the sons of Samuel were the, were, went away from the Lord, that wasn't the Lord's plan failing. That was man failing God's plan. So when I ask you, when I say that, because I hear so many times people, I'll knock on their door, I'll invite them to church, and I'll say, hey, would you come and visit our church services? And I've heard this so many times that I honestly don't care if I hear it again. I used to go to church. I used to ride the bus. I used to whatever it is. I used to be a deacon. I used to be, you know, fill in the blank, teach a Sunday school class. But, and they'll, they'll proceed to tell a story about how the pastor or the assistant pastor or the youth worker or someone in the church, you know, a Pharisee in the church, you know, did them wrong, you know, took advantage of them. It's true. That happens all the time, right? And, and I'm not saying that those people weren't wronged. There's a lot of terrible things that happen uh, from people in leadership in church that shouldn't happen. And I, I am sick over it. I wish that didn't happen. But... They're allowing man's failure to keep them away from the Lord, to keep them from growing as a Christian, keeping them from fulfilling really God's plan for them of coming into church and bringing glory to God, blessings for themselves, and plugging in their talents for everyone else to enjoy. They're missing all, on all of that. Why? Because of something that one person did. And you're allowing that to control uh, really the rest of your life. Bitterness is a, is a uh, liquid that only erodes the container in which it sits. It's like an acid. And the only person that it hurts is you. Don't allow man's failure to dictate your future decisions. Don't say, well, that pastor wronged me. I'm sure he did. I'm a pastor now and I know, uh, I, I, don't, I can't see inside the minds of all other pastors, but I can see in the mind of this one. And I know that there's a lot of sin. There's a lot of things that shouldn't be there. I don't want them to be there, but they are. And uh, I have the propensity to, to do you wrong, to say something that will hurt your feelings. And, and I hope that I never do, but inevitably I probably will. Don't allow that to keep you from church. Don't allow that to keep you from God's plan. Also, I see just because something has always been done or because it's what the majority is doing doesn't mean it's what God wants. Look at verse 5. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us. Underline this, like all the nations. Israel just wanted to be like everybody else. I want to ask you this question. If what the world has is so good, why is the world searching for what we have? Why is it when they hit rock bottom, why is it that every week I get multiple calls or a note on my desk from the secretary that, that there was a message left for pastor? I call them back. They're looking for some help with food. Some to be able to get into our program to help them with their electric bill. To come here and maybe get some counseling services. Or to get whatever it is, fill in the blank. How come is it when the world system fails, the first place they turn is church? Because we have what they want. We have joy and happiness. We have contentment. We have peace. We have grace and mercy from God. We have the blessings of God. So why do we want to try to shape and mold our lives and our facility and the way we run things just like what everyone else does. We need to be shaping it like this. But they said, well, make us a king like everybody else. It doesn't work. God told Samuel now to listen to the people. God told him that Israel was not rejecting him, but that they were rejecting God. Look at verse 9. Now therefore hearken unto their voice. Howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them. And this is really where the rest of the message is going to come from. And show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. This is what I wrote down for myself as a pastor. 
This is what that verse says to me. It's, I underline that phrase, yet protest solemnly. God told Samuel, keep preaching, even though no one else is listening. Israel is not interested in doing what I want them to do. They've seen what happens when I'm with them. They've seen what happens when I'm not with them. But on their own, they've decided they're not going to listen to me anymore. Hearken unto their voice, but protest solemnly. And that, that phrase in Hebrew, uh, protest solemnly, is a two-letter word, ud. It's a U with, the, the, uh, with a little marking over top of it, D, ud. It means to bear witness, to warn, to charge, and to testify. God told Samuel, they're not going to listen to me. But that doesn't matter. I still want you to ood. I still want you to protest. I want you to tell them what is going to happen if they don't listen to me. God has sent me here today to protest solemnly to you for just the next few minutes. To tell you what will happen when we don't listen to him. Whether that be in our lives, whether that be in our church, our family, and our country. And this isn't an original message because Samuel preached the message for me. I'm just going to share what he told you, or told the children of Israel. First of all, when God's people won't listen, we lose our children. Verse 11, and he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons. And then it goes and lists all the things that he will take the, your sons to do. And they're all for the king's Things all for the king's glory. He'll appoint them for himself, for his chariots, be his horsemen. He shall run before his chariots. And it goes on. Look at verse 13. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and cooks and bakers. Basically, he said he's going to take your children and he's going to use them for himself. Today, mainstream America is taking our children. If we don't rise up and listen to God, we will lose our children. They may not be taken physically in a physical sense, but they will be taken emotionally, they will be taken spiritually, they'll be taken morally, and they'll be taken intellectually. Mainstream America wants your children to believe that they are animals that evolved from a lower life form, that they're just cousins of monkeys. If you treat people like animals, do you know what they're going to start to act like? Animals. They want, a mainstream America wants your children to believe that there is no God, that there's no absolute right or wrong, that gender is a choice, sex is a game, babies are expendable, drugs are good, church is bad, money is king, the minority is the majority, history is irrelevant, the Constitution is a suggestion, Bible is archaic, guns are the problem, education is the solution, right is wrong, wrong is right, and that you are free to do as you want as long as we say so. That's what mainstream America is, is teaching, among other things. Unless God's children tune into God and stand up for what is right and stand on the word of God, we will lose our children. I'm a little bit passionate about it because I have young children. And by God's grace, I'm not going to get sucked into a lot of those things and a lot of that brainwashing, but my children may very easily. And it's time to just stand on the word of God. It's time to stop saying, well, I don't want to, you know, talk about politics because it might offend somebody. Boy, I hear a lot of things that offend me. I'm an American. My vote counts, does it not? You may say, well, it's not a big deal to listen to God. I'm telling you, I'm here to protest solemnly, solemnly with you today. It's a big deal. What will happen if God's children don't listen? First of all, we'll lose our children. Secondly, we'll lose our inheritance. Verse 14, he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive gardens, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and the goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work, and he will take a tenth of your sheep. He's going to take everything that's of value to you. He's going to take your things. And I don't know if things aren't, you know, of importance. But here's what I looked at when I thought of what, he, what will be taken from us if we don't listen to God. Our inheritance. First of all, our physical inheritance. Our thing. The things for which we labor. I know things aren't the sum total of everything. But the Bible says in Psalm 128, verse 1, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be. And that shall be well with thee. The things for which I have worked, I enjoy. 
my house isn't a mansion, but I enjoy going home and looking at the remodels that I've made and the mistakes that I've made while remodeling and now having to remodel my remodel. But hey, it's my stuff. If I want to tear it down, I can tear it down, you know? And I enjoy, God said, it's good for a man to have his own stuff and to work on it and enjoy those things. I love going into my backyard and um, playing with, with the kids and, and uh, trying to dodge around, you know, dog turds that are there. And it gets, it's my dog. It's my yard. I can do with what I want. But God said, those things will be taken away from me if you don't listen to me. And you know what he was talking about? Also, looking at an inheritance. Not only a physical inheritance, but our family inheritance. Proverbs 17, 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. We have a lot to lose with our family. And it already said they'll take our children, but we'll lose just everything that has to do with family. We haven't been listening to God for a while, collectively, as a nation. And it really should come as no surprise to us, but one of the most attacked organizations in America is the family. It's the home. The home, uh, if you find a child who has a mom and dad who, has had, who have been married to each other from the time that the child was born to the time that they graduate from high school, that is abnormal. Right? You think, oh, that, that's weird. You had a mom and dad who got married and uh, then, like, parented you. They stayed together the whole time you were a kid. And then when you graduated, you, you still had a parent. That's, that's weird. That's abnormal. It's more normal to have one parent or the other or two dads or two moms or now who knows what you have, right? An animal and a, a dad or a, a mom and a... a the family. If we don't listen to God, we'll lose our inheritance, our physical inheritance, our family inheritance, and our spiritual inheritance. Psalm 16, verse 5, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance, and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a goodly, a godly heritage. If we don't listen to God, We'll lose our children. We'll lose our inheritance. Two more. You'll lose your freedom. Verse 17. He will take the tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants. Say, is our freedom under attack here today in America? Our freedoms as born-again, Bible-believing, church-going, hard-working, blue-collar, tax-paying, gun-carrying, constitution-honoring, blood-born American men and women are under attack. This was a work that was written by Paul Solinsky. He was born in the early 1900s. In 1946, he wrote a book that outlined how to turn through socialism, a country into a communist country. He laid out eight points. How to change a country from through using socialism. If you Google, i just curious, I Googled, is America a socialist country? It said yes. We now are and identify as a socialist country. We are no longer really a democracy. And really we're on the brink of communism. Here is what Saul Solinsky, Alinsky, excuse me, said, you need to do, if you are leadership, looking to change your country to a communist country. One, health care. Control health care and you control the people. Poverty. Increase the poverty level as high as possible. Poor people are easier to control and will not fight back if you provide everything for them to live. Debt. Increase the debt level to an unsustainable level. That way you are able to increase taxes and this will produce more poverty. Gun control, number four. Remove the ability to defend themselves from government. That way you're able to create a police state. Five, welfare. Take, take control of every aspect, food, housing, income, of their lives because that will make them fully dependent on the government. Six, education. Take control of what people read and listen to and take control of what children learn in school. Seven, religion. Remove belief in God from the government and schools because people need to believe in only the government knowing what is best for the people. Last, eight, class well, warfare. 
Divide the people into wealthy and poor. Eliminate the middle class. This will cause more discontentment, and it will be easier to tax the wealthy with the support of the poor. We have to listen to God. Because that literally sounds like an outline of our country. That sounds like the eight-point constitution by which our government is ruling, regardless of party. What will happen if we don't listen to God? We'll lose our children. We'll lose our inheritance. We'll lose our freedom. Lastly, we will lose the Lord's blessing. Look at verse 18 and look at it as solemnly as you can. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen unto you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. We're getting exactly what we're asking for. And we say, God, what are you doing? And God's thinking, I didn't do anything. I literally gave you what you asked for. And he will not hear us. After that warning, what did, did that give you any chills down your spine? But I got a little flushed in the face reading through some of those things, and I've read them a lot, and I've been thinking about it and praying about it. You think, man, I'm going to go home after lunch. I'm going to pray for a country for a few minutes. I'm going to start praying more every morning, every evening, whenever it is on my drive to work for our country, for me to do my part to stand up for my family our church in this nation. But what did Israel do after they heard that message? Nevertheless, verse 19, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations. Hold on a second. That we may be like all the nations? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Come out from among them and be ye separate. And that our king may judge us. First, or Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, the Lord is our judge. He is our lawgiver. He is our king. And go out for us and fight our battles. Proverbs 21, verse 31, a, a horse is made ready for battle, but victory resteth with the Lord. They wanted to do everything for themselves that God was already offering to do for them. And that's where we're at here today. We're saying, well, we got this. We don't got this, folks. Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto their voice. God gave them exactly what they asked for. If you want to, if, you want to, if you're of, read the, read the end of the book. Kind of guy. Flip over to the last chapter of 1 Samuel. You'll see how it ends. It ends with the children of Israel sneaking back into the land of the Philistines and peeling off the decapitated, naked, mutilated body of King Saul and his warriors and his family off the wall that they had nailed there to say in complete and utter shame that they had conquered God's people. That's the end. I'm not saying that's what the end is going to be for us. But what I'm sharing with you is if we don't listen to God, if we don't listen to His Word, if we don't make this the final authority in our family, in our life, in our church, in our country, what's going to happen? We're going to lose our children. We're going to lose our inheritance. Our physical, our spiritual, and um, what was the other one? The other one. Our inheritance. We're going to lose our freedoms if we don't listen to God, if we don't serious up and pay attention to what God's saying. Where does that start? That starts with today. That starts with right now. What is God telling you to do? Don't put them off anymore. Don't go, well, I'll get around. We've got to start doing it right now. I want to say this. I am very encouraged with the state of our nation from the viewpoint that there are a lot of people a lot of God's people that are saying, enough's enough. We're going to stand up. I am so encouraged. I would encourage you, look at the Fill America website. You can click on each individual state, and it'll pull up every single independent fundamental Baptist church in that state that is making it an emphasis to pass out gospel tracts. Just in our state, I think there's 137, and that's just the ones that are documented. You can scroll down, and you can 
read the names of the pastors. You can read the names of the churches and, and where they're located. And you can be encouraged and think, man, there are a lot of people doing a lot of good, fighting the same fight for the same cause that we're fighting. And it doesn't seem so bleak and, oh, we're the only church that believes this up here in, you know, in northern Michigan. What can we do? We can do exactly what God asked us to do today. If that means pray a little bit more for your country, do that. If that means grab a stack of invites and go pass them out, grab a stack of invites and go pass them out. Whatever it is that God asks you to do, just do it. Because when we stop listening to God, and we start saying, I got it. I'm good. We'll lose our children. We'll lose our inheritance. We'll lose our freedom, ultimately, when God's people won't listen. 